1981. Pete Bloom got a letter from a UC Davis undergrad who happens to be very close to me. This undergrad had just discovered a Swainson's hawk nest next to UC Davis and had picked up a pellet that was completely mashed, interlocked, um, hard uh, exoskeletons from a few different beetles. And um, I thought, I mean, he thought that he had, you know, discovered something absolutely new, never seen in the literature, insectivory in a bootio. And this was so exciting that he figured out that the California expert in Swainson's Hawks was none other than Pete Bloom. And he wrote him a letter. We didn't have email then. And uh, within about two weeks, he got a letter back from Pete Bloom. And Pete Bloom said, that's very interesting. He didn't say, numb nut, didn't you read the literature? <laughs> He said that's very interesting, and it's widely known that they're insectivorous, but that's a really exceptional find to have found a pellet that was solid beetle exoskeletons next to a summertime Swainson's hawk nest in Davis. And he said, thank you for writing, and any time you want to share information about what you're seeing in Swainson's hawks, it's one of my favorite species, and I'm happy to talk about it. Is that why we're here? I mean, what a great move. And as you can see what it did for me, I left Swainson's Hawks immediately and started working on migration. But on the other hand, <laughs> Pete was completely inspiring, and um, I just wanted you to have that kind of a tidbit as to his character. Um, I'm not going to go through Pete's bio in detail because, frankly, we gave him way too much space in the booklet. Um, but it's a, good, it's a good, strong bio, and um, he's found out some of the most interesting information in Western raptor movements and Western raptor trends. Um, over the last 20 years, uh, 50 years really of work. And it gives me great pleasure today to be able to introduce him as our speaker. So give please a round of applause to Dr. Peter Bloom. Thank you, Alan. And thank you all uh, for coming and attending this meeting here in Sacramento. This is uh, the highest honor and privilege I'm sure I'll ever have in life is to speak to this group. Uh, you're all here. It's I hope, I hope uh, to shed some light on the conservation status of a lot of species in California and also introduce you to some unusual movements of common raptors. So the first portion of my talk will be basically summarizing a lot of what we've all done here in California for uh, sensitive species and then the, the second two-thirds of the talk I'll probably focus on my own research. We'll see how this all uh, uh, unfolds as the hour unfolds. First, uh, a quick flashback to the 70s. You can see our, our uh, designated hippie there, that's Lloyd Kiff with the beads in the front. Uh, definitely a California native kind of guy, although I think he's from West Virginia, but he's Californian. Uh, you'll note uh, a couple of dear friends that are no longer with us, Brian Walton, uh, is Richard Ohlendorf, which Butch was also the mentor to both uh, Alan and I. I mean, he's a direct reason why Alan and I are still doing this, I'm sure. There's a lot of other people in there, I'm sure, that you guys recognize. Hey, let's talk about conservation successes first. California condor, bald eagle, and peregrine. What do they all have in common? They all had issues with some form of contaminants or multiple contaminants. They weren't affected really by habitat loss. The majority of species I'll be talking today, uh, talking with you today about are those that do have habitat issues and that have been kind of left behind. Uh, we aren't seeing the kind of mitigations they, they, they deserve, that they need. And while the condor, bald eagle, and peregrine are well on their way or have completed the successful mission of, of uh, being taken off the list, California condor obviously is being worked on. Uh, there's all these birds out there that are losing habitat hand over fist, and we need to address that. So the, another portion of this talk that follows these conservation successes will be those species of special concern designated largely by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, but uh, also some blend with Audubon lists and such. The osprey actually is on this list as a conservation success, but really I, I see, in my opinion, the, the osprey probably was really never a depressed population in California. It had some peripheral effects perhaps due to contaminants, but that's kind of fuzzy. There really was no serious contaminant work on ospreys in California. So we're probably, we're really looking at a, a 
population that has expanded over time given all the new reservoirs and uh, frankly just uh, a lot of ospreys floating around looking for a place to nest. California condor, lead poisoning. That's almost certainly, I think everyone agrees it was lead poisoning that brought the California condor to its knees. Certainly there are other multiple other issues. DDE is still with us, at least coastally, in terms of affecting California condor reproduction. Power line collisions still occur, at least around release sites. And, but I do think that's been largely mitigated for. Micro trash will still be with us for a long time to come. Habitat loss will always be creeping up on California condors, but I don't see it as a major factor in holding the condor back. Having said that, as uh, Dr. Michael Scott, J. Michael Scott coined the term, this is the Cadillac of conservation reliant species. This is going to be something we manage probably forever. DD, lead is not going to go away even though it's been banned. There'll still be people using lead for decades. There's a big supply of lead out there. Not everybody is not going to use it. Some of them will always use it. Microtrash will still be there too. Microtrash, as we all know, affects young California condors as they're in their nests. So let's look back to 1982. Uh, that's when I started on the condor program. Had 21 birds in the wild and one in captivity. That was Topa Topa. We, had, uh, we now have 228 wild California condors and 193 captives. We also have <clears throat> three populations. We have the, the standard old historic distribution of the California condor, as well as Arizona in vicinity and down in Mexico. Major condor milestones, well, 1980, the California condor program was basically formally born. It was established. Not that people weren't studying condors, but they were basically watching them decline. Whereas in 1980, the Audubon Society and Fish and Wildlife got together and they said they were really going to do something, and they did. You wouldn't think that 1984, the year that the first California condor was uh, found dead, wild one, as a result of this program, would be a highlight but it really was, and I'll tell you why. There were a lot of folks out there prior to the condor program being initiated that said we couldn't catch them, we couldn't breed them, they, can't be, they shouldn't be in captivity, they'll never survive. And they wouldn't take a radio transmitter either. Well, not only did we successfully install a radio transmitter on IC-1, but he did exactly what we wanted him to do. He followed around his range, roughly about 3,000 square miles, following his parents, and ultimately died. And we found him immediately upon his death. John Schmidt, John Schmidt who isn't in the audience today, unfortunately, uh, was the one who found the bird freshly dead below a roost. That bird had a chunk of, a piece of shrapnel, a fragment of a lead, a copper jacketed lead bullet in its gut. So not only did he have high lead levels in his blood, but we had the fragment. So this was like a priceless moment in terms of condor conservation because we, we, we had our first hint that lead was going to be a serious issue. And of course, it was the issue. It is still is the issue. 1987, last condor captured. Lead ammo banned 2019. Lead has also been already been banned in much of the condor range <coughs> or all of the condor range and on the Tohon Ranch. Most notably, we got some major habitat conserved in the form of the Tejon Ranch, which is a 270,000 acre ranch in the Tehachapis of California, like the heartland of California condor movements for all of them, basically, except the ones up by Vantana. And they set aside 90% of those 270,000 acres. In other words, 240,000 acres to put that Contrast that with the existing national wildlife refuges, that's three times larger than the three national wildlife refuges dedicated to California condor conservation. Hopper, Sespe, and the Bitter Creek National Wildlife Refuge. Quite an achievement for a private company to dedicate that much land to conservation. And needless to say, a lot of burrowing owls, golden eagles, ferruginous hawks, and other sensitive species were captured in that mix as a result of the condor. Flipping on the bald eagle, DDE, uh, uh, 
uh, now much less an issue. It's still floating around out there because condors are still suffering from it. Lead poisoning is still out there. Electrocution is still an issue. Uh, but, the, but the bald eagle is really, really a success story in California. Basically, we had roughly 30 territories back in the 70s. We're now looking at 323 territories as of 2010. In my own experience, traveling around in helicopters looking for golden eagle nests, I'm finding bald eagle nests on ranch land where there's no water. All there are are squirrels. In other words, they're, they're actually surviving very well and reproducing in squirrel country. No fish involved, no waterfall involved to speak of. <clears throat> Since we don't have really good maps, we don't have any maps of, this, of the uh, new population in California, but there's, a, there's several more in Southern California on the mainland, on <coughs> reservoirs, and Dave Garcelon from the Institute for Wildlife Studies provided me the fact that we now have 19 pairs on five of the eight islands, whereas back in the 50s, it was down to zero. At this point, I also want to acknowledge um, doctors uh, Dan Anderson and Dr. Robert Risebro. These people are instrumental in the conservation of all of these species due to their work on brown pelicans, peregrines, condors, and bald eagles in particular. Uh, they, they, they really are much of the reason, they're the whole reason we still have these species. If that wasn't found when they did, if DDT wasn't recognized at that point, it might have been too late for a number of these species. We might not be feeling quite so successful. <coughs> Channel Islands, pre DDT, 15 pairs, predatory bird research group in, steps in, 1983. Uh, they release about 800 <coughs> peregrines from the beginning of that organization toward the end in California. We now have 47 breeding pairs on eight islands. Osprey, as I mentioned, I really see this species as not one that's coming back as a result of uh, contaminant issues. It's more an expansion uh, from uh, good reproduction elsewhere. And uh, we recognize at least 26 pairs in San Francisco Bay that are basically new, 10 in southwestern California, 10 at Mono Lake, which you'll hear more about uh, from one of my colleagues. The Channel Islands, though, remain completely extirpated. According to my good friend Lloyd Kiff, that was primarily a result of direct shooting, basically competition with fishermen. Major contributors to the recovery, at least the nonprofits, who are here before you. Major contributors from the agencies. Now let's talk about the flip side of all this active conservation, all this money, uh, all this funding, all this attention from all these serious researchers. And let's look at the uh, shortered owl and burrowing owl. These, in my opinion, are conservation failures, and I will develop that theme in the next few minutes. Importantly, you'll note that I make reference to GRIN. That's the Geographic Raptor Information Network. That was established by Lloyd Kiff when at the Peregrine Fund. <clears throat> is a vital source of information. And basically, parenthetically, those numbers for these species and the ones from um, uh, several slides back for those that were conservation successes are a relative number of publications that we found by putting the word California in with that species. 18 is dismal. Uh, that's n that means we know nothing because many of those records might be in a magazine. They're not there aren't peer-reviewed peer -reviewed journals, or they're in a book like Dawson's Accounts of California, or not Dawson, yeah, Dawson's Accounts of California Birds from about 1933. Uh, it's a species that we have not looked at. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, it looks like there's a lot of short-eared owls out there, but they're not. Um, this is sort of subjective. I don't have a whole lot of data to go with this, but I travel the state of California several times a year and have for about 40 years. And I'm looking at, at all populations. I'm trying to have a sense of what's going on. California is my study area. I don't do too much up in the Northwest because there's a whole lot of humble people up there that really do it well. So <laughs> you guys got that covered, but I work the rest of the place. But effectively, 
short-eared owls are extirpated as a breeding population below this line, south of that line. And this looks very promising. Those are the eastern Sierras and the Great Basin. But I've never seen breeding of short-eared owls in that area. I spent five years in the northeast portion of the state working for BLM, surveying all raptors, and I can tell you I never had a single nest. Now, that's not to say there weren't any nesting. There were in some of the national wildlife refuges, like the Kalamath Basin, Tule Lake vicinity. But the reality is they're few and far between. So my point is, while this is a beautiful map, it's very suggestive, we don't really know what's in that big blob. There might be six pairs, not 600. And in my opinion, it's probably in the neighborhood of about 300 pairs statewide or less. This is a really rare species, and essentially, we as conservation biologists, uh, we're flunking on this species. This should be an endanger a California state endangered species from my perspective after 45 years of roaming the state. Uh, and, and it needs some help, it needs some research to verify or, or, uh, <clears throat> or dismiss my thoughts. Now having said all that, it was negative. That area there in the Central Valley, the, uh, the area around Del, Del Norte and Eureka counties, uh, all of this, those are pretty decent nesting populations, but they're scattered in few and far, few and far between. Big issues are solar. Solar is just hammering habitat. Solar has to get on board that if you're gonna use, call yourself green energy, you really have to be green. It means mitigating with real land, not just, and what I mean here is you can help short-eared owls, you can help burrowing owls, you can help uh, northern harriers, um, most all raptors will benefit by preserving land. You don't have to develop the whole valley. And I, I see a lot of this going on, and I don't necessarily see the mitigation that ought to inherently go with it for an industry that claims itself as green. Got to get more green. Having said that, I have worked with companies. I'm a biological consultant. I do work with some people that step up to the plate. We do pretty good. I know the Audubon Society works with a lot of solar companies very proactively. There's planning involved. I mentioned that they were essentially as extinct below, below that line, uh, basically for Southern California. This, is a, this was the last breeding pair in Southern California in 1979. No one else has documented any breeding activity. It was kind of a fluke. They were probably in the order of a dozen to maybe even 30 pairs at that little place called Harper Dry Lake. It was a dry marsh, was a little wet that year, a lot of tules, and there were huge numbers of nesting harriers and short-eared owls, basically 50 yards apart on, on maybe 50 acres of marshland. That is now essentially gone because of this very large solar project that went in next door. I don't know that they're extirpated, but I'm not optimistic about finding them any longer. Burrowing owl, same thing, uh, except I wouldn't propose listing this as endangered. I would propose that it does need to be listed as state threatened. This is a species for which we have published a lot on. We know about burrowing owls. We know their needs. We don't need more research, really. We just need to start saving some habitat. It needs to start real soon, and I'll provide you some evidence for why that's the case. 1978, designated species of special concern. By the way, Swainson's hawk was designated in 78 as a species of special concern. The Department and Bureau of Land, the Bureau of Land Management put a bunch of money into it, a modest amount of money into it, and it resulted in the species being listed as state threatened. That animal has only benefited from that designation. The burrowing owl has been proposed for listing and was not accepted. I suggest to the environmental community, the scientific community, that it's time that we can't simply continue to watch burrowing owl numbers decline across the state. Speaking of declining across the state, let's focus on my home, which is basically Southern California, this coast from San Diego, from say Tijuana to Santa Barbara, but particularly between those two locations. I saw my first burrowing owl as a result of my parents when I was about eight years old. That was in Orange County at a place called the Buffalo Ranch. There was Knott's Berry Farm, Disneyland and the Buffalo Ranch. The Buffalo Ranch had burrowing owls. I never forgot that. 
That place is under either South Coast Plaza or Fashion Island now. But there were dozens of pairs of burrowing owls in that area. Well, this year, we watched the last pair in burrowing owl, of burrowing owls <clears throat> of interest. They're both females. So fragmentation is a huge issue that, that goes with habitat loss. And uh, we've been essentially down, where I can see that far. That, that's the Seal Beach colony. This is a naval weapon station, Seal Beach, by the way. And they've <clears throat> been very effective at guarding and managing these birds for the last 30 years, at least. They weren't able to attract any of the birds from this area or that area. Basically, that 50, 70 mile distance was too much. There was no immigration coming in. We brought some birds in through active translocation, but for some reason, the state later banned that as a conservation tool. Go figure. I mean, you have birds winking out all across the state, little groups of them, little fragments, little genetic jewels, and they're and they're, we're letting them disappear. We know that they can be translocated. Unlike a lot of other raptors, you can do that with some burrowing owls with some success, but we don't have it as a tool any longer. My point is here, or one of my points is, uh, I don't see San Diego or the Riverside San Bernardino area, I don't see those populations lasting a lot longer. Give them another 20 or 30 years. I've been in Orange County for 58 years, and all I've seen is decline. And there's no reason to think it's going to get any better for those remaining populations. This is one member of the last pair in Orange County, 2015. She is a six-year-old female that we banded there as a nestling. Note, very high philopatry and burrowing owls. It's a characteristic of a lot of birds of prey and something that will be much of the theme of my talk today. Philopatry is a very positive evolutionary result. It's also something that is a conservation drag. It is hard to compete with philopatry when you're trying to expand populations. Squirrel eradication, huge issue. Uh, without squirrels, you don't have burrowing owls. Antelope Valley, Imperial Valley, solar is major in terms of what's going to happen with the last burrowing owls and the last Swainson's hawks. If we don't do some concerted planning with the solar industry, we're going to lose both species in those areas. Here's an example in the Antelope Valley, good one actually. If this was in the Antelope Valley, this, this large solar project would probably include about three pairs. That same size project in the Imperial Valley would probably hold about 50 to 100 pairs. It all has to do with the crop that's being farmed in the area, alfalfa. So a little evidence that we might be alarmed about, the Sandy and Rule in 1995 suggested an 8% decline uh, annually. And that, that started out from about 90, I think it was 9,600 pairs of the statewide estimate. So where that's at right now, we don't know, but it's a good time to look. Look at the size of those, uh, those developments in Imperial County as far as uh, new crops, such as sugarcane for ethanol and solar. It's really time to get, get serious about listing the burrowing owl, and I would suggest, again, threatened, not endangered. Conservation challenges for the remaining species. Swainson's hawk, it's about habitat loss. It was historically in 19... 79 when I did that work for the department and for the BLM. Uh, it's still an issue, but it's not treated very seriously. I'm a biological consultant. I also do a lot of research in conservation. I want to suggest to you that the consultants working in the Antelope Valley and in the Central Valley need to be more forceful about the idea of mitigating for habitat, whether it's an urban project, a solar project, and less important in this instance, a wind project. But having said that, wind is, of course, extremely important in the Altamont. I'm going to say roughly 400 owls or burrowing owls are killed every year. And those birds aren't making it to their wintering grounds. And the Southern California vicinity, that whole coastal strip in LA, that's a biological sink. Birds land. I, I, have, a, I have an observation several years ago of a burrowing owl landing near Wilshire Boulevard. Well, it was frantic. You could see it knew it was in the wrong place. And I don't know what happened to it. I suspect it did not come out of Wilshire Boulevard. Golden Eagle, it's all about lead, electrocution, wind farms, and habitat loss. White-tailed kite, habitat loss. 
Let's talk about Swainson's real quick. The Antelope Valley is uh, or that western, that's the western Mojave Desert right there that I'm looking out to my left. And that's where our largest and remaining population of Swainson's hawks, nesting Swainson's hawks, exist in California. And they're suffering from the same issues that the burrowing owl is. It's all habitat related. Here's a close up of those populations. Uh, this is a species that does use Joshua trees, so the Mojave Desert is its playground. They should be nesting throughout, but they're not. The last pair in the east is that red dot up here back in 1980. These birds, though, are still with us, but the local ones there are severely threatened by solar development. Golden Eagle, as I mentioned, big issues with wind, lead, electrocution, and also habitat loss. This ring of this, this big void of golden eagles, that's all agriculture. But that edge, those are, that's all some of the best golden eagle nesting habitat in the state. Within about 10 miles of where agriculture stops, there are just boodles of nesting golden eagles at very high densities. White-tailed kite, it's kind of an en en enigmatic species. We don't know a lot about this animal, except that its populations rise and decline every decade. Currently, we're in a real decline, at least speaking for Southern California, where perhaps it's a little more arid. But we see very little reproduction and have seen very little reproduction for the last decade. The, the questions are, how much, does, how much do rodenticides play in this issue? How do you tease out the, the issues of drought in long-term climate change? But habitat loss is always uh, munching away at this bird's habitat. To give you an example of how drastic this population changed in Orange County, back in 1974, I had 10 roosts. One of those roosts was at the University of California, Irvine, San Joaquin Marsh. There were 400 birds at that marsh in November of 1974. There aren't five pairs in Orange County anymore. Uh, and I, say, I mentioned that was only one of 10 roosts, so there were probably several hundred birds. This map, real quick, effectively, the last five years, these are all kite territories, no reproduction the last five years. Why is that? Is it the climate? No voles, no kites, or is it rodenticides? Is it West Nile virus? Now we get on to a subject, now we're going on to some research, actually, some, some results here, some real science, uh, other than me speculating and, and uh, being an advocate. 